Hello, bravs. We're back with more Napoleon Bisexual Empire. Emperor? Empire? Emperor? Major General Frank Richardson, MD. Let's continue with Chapter 3 and knock this out before I go to work. Many aspects of Napoleon's character have been attributed to his Corsican nature and even to a racial strain, variously described as Arab, Berber, Moorish, or Libyan. France had a next Corsica and just in time, just in time for Napoleon to be born a Frenchman, but annexation could not alter the Corsican character, which was very un European. The people in that part of Corsica where Napoleon was born are said to have been born been of North African origin, for Arab peoples seem to have gone to Corsica even before the Saracens. Napoleon himself called Corsica's a little isle half African, and when welcoming Dr. Antomarchi to the St. Helena, still don't get why they don't put periods after abbreviated words, but there we go. he spoke proudly of the warlike qualities of the particular type of Corsican from who he himself was descended. Antomarchi, more Italiante, Italian, Italianate, or is it Nate, Italianate, was in Napoleon's eyes the wrong kind of Corsican. This racial theme is developed at great length by B. Fortescue in his book Napoleon's Heritage. Some of the oriental traits which he discerns in Napoleon's makeup are his superstitiousness and love of ghost stories, his profound belief in destiny, fate, omens, and in his star. His oft-expressed preference for the Mohammedan faith has usually been assumed to have been politically inspired. I was a Mohammedan, 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 Mohammedan in uh, Egypt. I shall be a Catholic in France, but it could have sprung from the Oriental strain. Fortescue asserts that incest was common in Corsica, and Napoleon certainly seemed surprisingly indifferent to accusations of that crime. Corsicans, we are told, are no respecters of rank, which could have helped the young Bonaparte and his dealings with the great ones of Europe. The constant trouble with the emperor experienced with his family summed up in his own remark that when he gave a throne to a brother, he made one enemy the more, is seen by Fortescue as evidence of the family's Corsican nature, always in power or in revolt. Finally, the unwritten Arab law of asylum could have led to the bland confidence in with which Napoleon cast himself upon the mercy of the most implacable of his enemies, and incidentally to the sense of grievance which tormented him for the rest of his life, as being treated as a prisoner of war instead of being allowed to end his days in dignified retirement in England. An Arab would have regarded this as a perfidious, perf perfidious betrayal of one who had sought hospitality. These racial studies are interesting, but I am convinced that a far more important factor in Napoleon's case was his own attitude to his Corsican nationality, and this was far from consistent at different times of his life, being always strangely ambivalent. On the surface, Frenchmen are no more ashamed of being Corsican or Alsatian from than Britons are of being Scots, Irish, or strange, or Welsh, but membership of a minority race in a nation can have strange effects. We Scots have been told that the perfervid, perfervid Scotsman who ply, plies the English, I'm fucking bumbling this, who plies the English with food and drink on national feast days in order to subject them to the here's teos, what's like us treatment in exhibiting symptoms of national inferiority and no doubt similar self-assertiveness on the part of the Irish and Welsh strikes the English as a plant of the same species. I cannot recall being offered so much as a cup of tea on St. George's Day, and it seems that the English need no such props to sustain their serene conviction of superiority, which they are accustomed to being told acts as an irritant to other nations, as we have seen that it did to Napoleon. Nationalistic feelings strive when far from the homeland, and never can there have been a lonely ex expatriate Corsican, the little Napoleon born apart, who from the age of nine was for nearly six years the only Corsican boy in the military school at Brienne, hardly ever visited by his parents or by any other Corsicans. Even his name, which he sometimes spelled Nabouleon, was odd, and the French boys mockingly called him Pelé or Nez, straw on the nose. His outburst of temper naturally aggravated the teasing and bullying to which he was subjected, and this fed his hatred of the other boys, out of which grew contempt for them and their nation. To 
keep his end up, he grew more and more rapidly Corsican, more anti-French, more liable to violence. He once said to D. Borean, I will do these French all the mischief I can. In school reports, he was called typically Cor Corsican. Living in France, that only made him more Corsican, but encouraged him to form a romantic picture of Corsica as a community in which the idea of society visualized by Rousseau truly became a reality. As a young officer, he was still very insular and spent all the time he could in Corsica, overstaying his leave and getting embroiled in local politics and intrigue. Finally, he fell foul of the great Paoli, Il Babbo, the father of Corsica, and antagonized so many of his compatriots that he had to flee to France, having made his island too hot to hold him. During his anti-French period, he became a great admirer of England and even thought very seriously of joining the British Navy. As the son of his beloved foster mother, Camilla Ellery, had done when he had to leave Corsica, he toyed with the idea of joining the British in India, but later we hear of him wanting to go and organize Indian native artillery against the British. But France was then ablaze, and Napoleon, encouraged by his remarkable mother, was quick to realize that there were chestnuts to be pulled out of that fire by a young soldier of fortune who did not mind getting his fingers banned. France, wary of upheaval and instability and longing for any settled form of government, was ripe for a strong ruler, and Napoleon was later to say, France had greater need of me than I of a... Uh... So the young warrior set his foot in the stirrup of the charger, which was to carry him to greater fame than any of the great captains of old, whose stories he loved. To read, France may have been his war horse, but he never truly loved her as a good rider loves his horse. But he never truly... Oh, man, man, that's just fucking babbling. There we go. His first great opportunity was when he assumed command of the army of Italy, where his Italian nature and appearance and his knowledge of the language were a great help to him. But the more he perceived the dazzling prospects which lay open to him from exploitation of the confusion in the French nation, the more did he realize that if he was to become the ruler for whom the nation was longing, he must become a true Frenchman. And just as the process... The process of compensation for the feelings of inferiority of the lone, rough, little Corsican among the cultured young arist aristocratic French cadets had driven him to be excessively Corsican. So now the realization that he could never be or even feel a true Frenchman intensified his strivings to be French. He made the most of having been born a Frenchman and changed his name from Buonaparte to Bonaparte, but as usual, he overdid it all. Frenchmen have said that he always spoke and wrote of France as no real Frenchman ever would. And the Russian writer, Mera Zhukovsky, quoting his remark, I have one passion, one mistress, France, commented that men do not speak thus of their native country. To them, she is not the mistress, but the mother. Arthur Levy, one of the, one of Napoleon's most sycophantic admirers, quotes Merezkovsky's comment, but waxes indignant at the horde thought that France's greatest hero was not French. But Levy had to admit that even Napoleon himself was a little surprised by the intensity of his own feelings on the subject. Napoleon said in St. Helena, I wanted at all costs to be a Frenchman. Being called a Corsican was to me the bitterest of insults, recalling the tale of the mayor of Lyons, Lyons, who, intending to compliment him, said that it was amazing how great he loved France, though he was not a Frenchman. He said it was as though he had struck me with a knife. He was able to identify himself and his interest with France to that high degree, which seems to characterize French despots. And he could claim le tat, c'est moi, with even more justification than could Louis the Fourteenth, though perhaps with not much more than de Gaulle at the height of his power. But for all of his frequent protestations of love and the, for the French, his feelings about them were really very mixed and very strangely linked with his feelings about the English. He once said, there are only two great nations, France and England, the rest are nothing. And he had for both nations a curious love-hate relationship. It was not only during his strongly Corsican phase that he expressed contempt for the French, he often compared them adversely with the English. He considered that the English were more practical than the French and also braver. His judgment on the latter point was, I think one can say that in courage they are to us what we are to the Russians, what the Russians are to the Germans, and what the Germans are to the Italians. 
As he had conquered all the others, this obviously put Britain at the top of the league. Before going to Elba, he spoke feelingly to the British commissioner. Your nation is great, and I have the highest esteem for its people. I have wished to raise the French nation also. And here Sir Neil Campbell reported, he seemed to become affected and stopped speaking. He showed his feelings even more plainly when he said to General Gourgaud, the British Navy would be much less able to carry on the struggle with us if we had but half the English national spirit. Lord Rosebery quoted what he rightly called the noble tribute, which included such expressions as the English character is superior to ours, and had I... Had I had an English army, I should have conquered the universe. Napoleon implied on one occasion that he thought he could have led English troops better than their own officers, a point on which we may feel considerable doubt. Lord Rosebery found Napoleon's ignorance about England and the English national character unusual in a man with who normally studied his opponents. He could be roused to intense indignation by hostile reports about him in the British papers, which he insisted on having translated for him. He had many stronger reasons for anger with our country. The British Navy barred the path to world dom dominion, and before he even heard of Nelson, he used to say that Sir Sidney Smith had robbed him of his triumph. Our small army in the peninsula made of Spain that running soul... The hell does that mean? Our small army in the peninsula made of Spain the running soul which weakened his empire. How well stiffened the opposition of the continental powers. He loved to repeat Paoli's jibe that we were a nation of shopkeepers, but it led him to the false assumption that we live by selling, and since he could not prevent his vassals from allowing us to buy, his famous continental blockade rebounded on his own head. It even caused dissension between him and his brothers, who, incomprehensibly to Napoleon, insisted on considering the interests of the people over whom he had set them to rule. For all his admiration of our national character, he was not the man to let noble sentiments temper his aggression. Where an enemy was concerned, his brutal wish that Sir John Moore's army could have been much larger so that more English mothers might feel the horrors of war shows what our civilian population could have expected if he could have got at us. We can dismiss such remarks as wartime propaganda and forget them. For enough has been said to prove that considerations of nationality meant a lot to Napoleon, that his feelings on the subject were strangely mixed and could have been a source of feelings of inferiority. Even when he was emperor of the French, he knew that we could never be a, he could never be a tr real true Frenchman, and sometimes he longed for the French to possess certain national characteristics, which he ardently admired in the British. An intriguing sidelight on this question of his nationality was his attitude to the gossip of an alleged liaison, liaison between his mother and General Count Marbouf, the French governor of Corsica, which was probably just a malicious rumor. Napoleon seems to have almost hoped to prove that this French general was his father, which he thought might account for his passion for military affairs. It might also free him from the fear of cancer from which Carlo Bonaparte had died and which he believed to be hereditary. It is very likely that he also hoped that it would make him feel more French. Children who are dissatisfied with their homes and families often daydream about being the offspring of different and often of noble parents, but such fantasy parents are seldom in the dreams of successful men of thirty, which was Napoleon's age. When he finally decided that Carlo Buonaparte had, after all, been his real father, Napoleon had really no reason to be ashamed of his father, who in 1771 had been recognized as being of noble birth and later was appointed the deputy in Paris to the Corsican nobility. Many people wrongly believed that Napoleon was humble, was of humble origin, and rose from the ranks because of his name of the Little Corporal, which, like Marlborough's, Nickname of Corporal John was really a mark of affection by his troops. It has been said that a corporal is almost a comrade. His authority is more or less fraternal. But although Napoleon could claim to be well-born, tracing his ancestors, his motherfucking ancestry back to good Ligurian families, it was only Corsican nobility, and he... And as he became more and more infatuated with blue blood, his reactions became more typical of the parvenu. 
plagued by a deep sense of social inferiority. One of the qualities which gave Josephine such a firm hold on him was the help which her aristocratic connections could give him in the early tentative flirtations with the old French nobility. In his own simile, she was an anchor for his salvation from the isolation which he felt because his rise from the masses had been too sudden. He had, he said, to keep on throwing out anchors, and these included the new royalty and aristocracy which he created from his family and supporters. It was all amusingly like a series of army postings when Brother Joseph was promoted from king, from being king of Naples to, the, to be king of Spain. Brother-in-law Joachim Morat was posed to succeed him in Naples, like war office generals in the game of general post. They sometimes groused if they thought they were being passed over, though usually, still true to form, it was their wives who did the grousing. Napoleon expected them to abide by what he might call his standing orders for royal personages, and here it all tended to break down because his brothers developed strong individual lines of their own, and to his intense annoyance often opposed him, for he was not the only Bonaparte with a will of his own. When their stubbornness exasperated him, he used to taunt them with their Corsican blood. Apart from Napoleon's admission that he felt a sense of isolation because of his sudden rise from the masses, many indications betrayed his deep-seated sense of social inferiority, and it may have been that, this which led him to resent so hotly the absurdly exaggerated wartime propaganda directed against him and his family. A true aristocrat would have scorned to notice such crude attacks as those of Louis Goldsmith, who raked up every possible slur on the Bonapartes and poured derision upon them in wildly intemperate language. But the Dictionary of National Biography tells us that Napoleon certainly winced under these attacks, and according to Goldsmith, offered him 200,000 200,001 to discontinue them. What's that? What's that one symbol? Or is that Lara? Is that the Lara? I don't even know what the... I thought it was Franks. Anyway, of course, in his zeal for the noblemen of his family and supporters, Napoleon grossly overdid things like any social climber. We nobles, he would say, and he referred to Louis the Sixteenth as my poor uncle. The real aristocrats may have laughed up their sleeves, but there, these were no laughter in the hearts. But there was no laughter in the hearts of genuine Republicans, who saw the goddess for fraternite and egalite follow liberty into oblivion. For example, at one of his state balls in 1812, the bourgeoisie were not only forbidden to dance, but could not even go to the buffet, and waited in their places for footmen to bring refreshments. Claude Manseron is by no means the only historian to call Napoleon a snob, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American philosopher and SAS wasted few words. Napoleon was not a gentleman, but an imposter and a rogue. The authoress, Dormer Creston, Miss Dorothy Colston Baines, though less severe, is a staunch and convincing advocate of the theory that Napoleon's vaulting ambition was largely a product of a lifelong uneasiness about his social position. To sum up, Napoleon's medical history revealed clear evidence of a neurotic constitution and physical signs of a troubled mind, various factors which could have troubled his mind and nourished his aggressive megalomania have been discussed in this chapter. Our examination of Napoleon's body indicates that, as with many neurotics, the roots of his trouble were probably planted deeply in some form of psychological conflict concerning the sexual instinct. This deserves a, chap a chapter to itself. The spectrum of Sex, Chapter 4 awaits.